Hey everybody, we are behind the scenes at our weekly radio program. We are recording in the studio at the Hayburn Building. I've got uh, oops, Dr. Polio is our special guest today. And we've got Yvonne on the button over here. She'll be joining us in just a second. So uh, you're behind the scenes. Welcome and thanks for tuning in. Hello and welcome. Thank you all for joining us. We are live in the studio and our special guest is Dr. Marty Polio, the superintendent of Jefferson County Public School. Good evening. How are you, Gay? Yvonne, good to be here with you all. <laughs> Thank you. It's so nice. We've got Yvonne here with us too. We're live streaming on Facebook and I've got a big water bottle right there in the middle. So if you are listening in the radio and you happen to be driving home and you at home and want to continue the, the, the program, you can join us on Dear JCPS's Facebook page. Um, also, it is a low signal radio station, so you may just drive out of range and, and want to catch up on what the rest of the show we talk about on the show, so you can always visit our Facebook page and watch the playbook uh, playback later. Yay, I have an important question. Suppose that I was at my computer and wanted to hear an episode later. What should I do? Oh, that's an excellent question, Yvonne. <laughs> We like to put our, our past shows up on SoundCloud, so this show as well as previous shows can be found at the Forward Radio Archive uh, on SoundCloud.com. There's a special channel under Forward Radio for Save Our Schools this year. So we'll put this up there as soon as we get a chance to get it uh, edited and re-uploaded, so hopefully in the next day or so. So thank you all for joining us. We're very excited to have you as our guest. And um, I'm going to just start off with a little chit chat because okay. I don't know if our listeners, we may have listeners that are new to JCPS mm -hmm. and we may just have listeners who have been living under a rock. I don't know. Um, but we want to give a little bit of the history about how you came to sure. be superintendent of Jefferson County Public Schools and maybe even uh, reference, if you don't mind, some of the things that your JCPS uh, had uh, advocated for and some of the some of the evolution of your becoming our superintendent. Sure. Um, well, I was talking to um, over the past few weeks, this is the time of year where I get to go back or talk to all kinds of groups. Uh, so I was talking to new teachers today. I talked to the Atherton faculty um, at their retreat. I've done it with a lot of role groups. And so it's easy to reflect on the opening day of school. So I was reflecting back to my first day of school in JCPS, which was August of 1997, um, and I was talking to our new teachers about going to the retreat. The Shawnee had a retreat, um, and how excited I was to be a new teacher. And of course, I went to the retreat, retreat in a shirt and tie, and was the only person there in a shirt and tie. Um, so I realized quickly that I was overdressed. Um, <laughs> but I um, was a teacher and a basketball coach at Shawnee High School. Did the same at Wagner High School for a couple of years before I um, wanted to go in a different direction. And as many leaders are, were tapped on the shoulder by 
then Principal Jim Jury, where I was in my late 20s, didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and he told me he thought I would be a good principal. And I always felt like principal was my path. So for the next four or five years, I worked in a, working towards getting my administration certification while I was teaching at Wagner. Um, and then became an assistant principal and eventually a principal at J-Town High School. Was principal there for eight years. Um, learned a lot, my beliefs about culture and climate, um, supporting kids, engaging kids in school. It's also often during that time where um, a lot of the things that you advocate, which is test prep, um, and doing those uh, just driving testing. Advocate um, against, I'd like to add that. Correct. <laughs> but that, that's correct. I yeah. didn't mean advocate yeah, for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, that type of instruction um, can really um, disengage kids from school. And so we can do both. We can prepare kids for assessments while engaging them, increasing their belonging, um, real uh, passion for the academy work, getting kids on pathways. Um, and then after uh, a couple of years, uh, eight years there, Dr. Hargens, our former superintendent, asked me to take over the DOS principal job, which was the best move I ever made gave me the chance to work at, at that time, which was considered the second lowest high school in the state by state scores. Um, went there and put together a great team and just had two incredible years, uh, probably the two best years of my career, working on wall-to-wall -wall academies with an intense focus on student engagement. Um, I think the first time I met you was when Ted Dintersmith yeah. had a, um, a showing of um, his documentary. Doss High School, and we met and talked about that being the pathway to go. Um, and then after two years, I had no intention of being the acting superintendent. That was the last thing on my mind. As a matter of fact, I was like everyone else wondering who it would be, and then got the call for me to come and interested if I would interested in applying, um, which I decided I would kind of take a crack at it, went in and had the interview and knew it went well. That next day, I got a call from that time Chair uh, Brady, who asked me if I would be acting superintendent, and had that oh, you know what moment when, okay, this is going to be mine now. And it's 100,000 students, and a city like this, as big as it is, 27th largest in America. But as I always do, I dove in head first because, um, and the reason I took this job, I told our board this, I told them this Tuesday night, this job's tough, it's hard work. I wouldn't do this anywhere else. And the main reason I'm doing this is because I care for JCPS, I care for our students. I see 23 years worth of kids all the time, colleagues, um, that have just been so meaningful to me. So it's a tough, hard job. Uh, it's not easy, it's 24 seven, but I do it because I love this district. I think we have so much potential to be great. And I hope to be the person that leads us through these challenging times. Yeah, I think we're at a crossroads. It's a really critical yeah, time. Yeah, I agree. It's not just, you know, somebody holding a job and major changes and major decisions that need to be made and you came up for it so we're well, we're happy you took the job and we say, are happy thank you and i appreciate that and i'll say this I've, I've said this frequently this job is one that um i call it kind of paralysis because any major decision or change you're making comes with a lot of unrest and pushback yeah. it's just inevitable um, so if you're not careful it's very easy to just try to keep the status quo which I think has happened in recent years in JCPS. And so challenging the status quo is difficult when you have 155 schools, um, and community and involvement and all that's important, but this is not a time where we can have the status quo. We have to make change and I think um, it's for the better. Status quo would, with everything hanging over our heads, status quo would lead to our demise because we're facing a state, another state audit and a potential state takeover and we all know I agree 100%. So we have about 14 months left until that happens. We've made incredible progress in the past 12, but there is no doubt um, we have to continue to make progress and movement um, so that this next audit is a very positive one. Well, um, to fill in some of that a little bit too, I'd like to, um, in fact, I'd like to correct an article that was in uh, the Leo Weekly. I don't know if you saw this last week. I did not. There was a really great article uh, written by Daniel Grady uh, called Small Groups Push Oversized Change, Moving the Needle. Small Groups Push Oversized Change, and it highlighted several groups in the community that are doing some of this work, and your JCPS was one of the organizations that was mentioned. 
Um, we did push to get new board members. Uh, we did not uh, mention Chris Brady. Um, Chris Brady was already a board member. We didn't get him elected, but we kept, uh, we pushed to keep him elected and keep out uh, a dark money challenger. And then uh, Chris Colvin. He had like $300,000. Yeah. Obviously. Right. And so we pushed to keep him out and Brady in, as well as Ben Geese and Chris Kolb in. And one of the main reasons that we supported them and campaigned for them and endorsed them was because they made a commitment to make changes in district leadership. It's no secret that our organization was formed around the, um, I call it willful incompetence. It, uh, it may not be that, but it just seemed like it because there were so many so many low-hanging fruit, um, meaningful solutions that Dr. Hargens could have made, and she continued to, to circumvent and change the subject and bury things and, and did more harm than good to vulnerable populations like that county. And so as we continued to push back, it became more obvious that she either couldn't learn or didn't want to learn, and she needed to go. So we pushed to get new board members in place who would her out and bring in a new superintendent. So that's another kind of our history mm -hmm. and where right. we come from. And I remember, I remember it well. I was here <laughs> through all well, of it. Yeah, I know. No. And um, so I'm just for our listeners. So yep. I wanted to explain that. And um, I remember getting a actually as soon as you got the interim position, we called and, and arranged a meeting, and you met with us right away. And the media called me and asked me what we thought about the, the new superintendent, interim superintendent, and. I said, what a breath of fresh air, because every time we had tried to get a meeting with Dr. Hargens, it was derailed. It, uh, every, every position of influence that I tried to, to uh, get into in the district, she managed to remove me from. I was academic coordinator at my son's school. I lost that job. I was on the SCDM for 18 months. Suddenly, there was no record I had ever served when it came time to pick a principal. Um, the PTA, you know my story mm -hmm. about PTA and being forced out. Yeah based on her call that she made to PTA leadership. So she did, she was deliberate about keeping me from helping kids and serving kids. And, and that just, that was a red flag. I knew there was something wrong there. So um, that's how we came about yep. and you came to our meetings and we've, been, we've had a really great dialogue and mm -hmm. uh, I have your cell phone and yep. I text you regularly, <laughs> sometimes at 1130 at yep. night, um, but you, you always respond. Uh, in fact, you worked on something for me just yesterday that I brought to your attention, and we're going to talk about that on the show as well. But I just want to make sure our listeners are aware that you come from uh, the district, which you've mentioned, and this is such a complex district with so many it unique is. and complicated mm -hmm. challenges. We cannot bring in some Eli Broad graduate ugh, ugh, and expect them to hit the ground running because they don't know our history. Uh, our student assignment and busing history are uh, the groups that have agendas and, and what those agendas might be. Um, there's just a lot. So it, it's really great that we've got someone who's, who's one of us. Yeah, thank you. So I, you know, I, I do think, um, I've, I've, without getting into my predecessor, which I try to stay away from, I've been very open and honest that one of the reasons I took this position because I did not like where the district was heading, the direction we were on, and I knew we needed change. Um, so working that has been important to me. I do think there's positives and negatives for hiring someone internal, and I'll say, and I've struggled through that. So, you know, the positives being, and you don't take a, have to take a long time to learn the district. I was in for 20 years. I knew the district. You know, the negatives, sometimes you become so entrenched in the way things are done, mm -hmm. you might not challenge the status quo. So mm -hmm. I've had to make sure I do that. I think this was the right time for an internal candidate. Um, and other times maybe it won't be, but for right now it right. was. Um, and, but the, the thing I've had to do is to make sure that um, I surround myself with making sure to challenge the way we've always done things. And then the second thing is I have always prided myself on, even if they're going to be tough meetings, that people that disagree with me, that you're better off having the meetings and having dialogue and discussion. Oh, absolutely. And, and having that discussion and then trying to come to some understanding or middle ground right. in that meeting. So I've always tried to do that. Well, and um, like myself, you know, being having a son at Shawnee, but not being uh, from that community, um, I've had a lot of blind spots. And you, 
don't want to speak for you, but I I know that when we take on something new that is outside of our comfort zone, mm -hmm. we have blind spots. Yep. And one another compliment I would like to give to you is um, that you are you recognize that you have blind spots. You have a, everything you've done hasn't been perfect. Yep. No, there's no doubt <laughs> about that. But you acknowledge that, yeah. and you learn from that, and you want to do better. Yeah. And that's that is so important, especially when we're serving communities who who uh, struggle to yeah. have their own agency and advocacy, and we're trying to to be part of that solution, and we don't want to cause more harm than good, or unintended consequences, or be that white savior, or any of those things. So, um, recognizing those blind spots and adapting and listening, getting out in the community and listening is so key. So. Well, when you make, you know, I was frustrated today because I had to answer 500 questions, and so some small, some big, and you're making that many questions, uh, answering that many questions, and making decisions about things that might you think might be small while also building big change and making very important decisions, um, you have to recognize that um, sometimes you make mistakes and, and you have to reflect and constantly ref uh, reflect. And so in this job, any job, I think reflection is so important. Mm -hmm. What could I have done better? What would I have done differently if I did it over again? Who would have I have talked to? Um, and maybe you would do the same thing and maybe it wasn't the, the decision, maybe it was the process. Maybe you could have made the process better and brought more people along. Um, so that's what I've tried to do. I've learned so much in two years um, about this job. I've learned a lot about myself. Um, it definitely exposes your blind spots and those things that you need to improve as a leader. Um, and so reflection is so important. So um, in the article, I mentioned that um, you've never lied to me. And... I think it says that you move a little slower than I would like, but again, that's the process, that's the size of the district, that's the mm -hmm. magnitude of the decisions that you're making on a daily basis. So um, if you haven't had a chance to read it, I encourage people to pick it up. Um, it's no longer on stands, but it's online. So uh, there's a, there's a uh, review of several groups. That, uh, in that's interesting. Group. I'm going to have to read it because I've been criticized by others by moving too fast. Oh, well, so <laughs> if, if you think I'm moving too slow and they think I'm moving too fast, maybe I hit the, the maybe sweet spot. Maybe so. Maybe <laughs> so. I like that. Um, so let's talk about student assignment. That sure. is probably the most, I consider it to be the most important work we're doing in this district ever, but especially right now. Because well, at least in the last 20 years. Yes. And it's tied to our audit. It's tied to this potential state takeover. So um, that's one of the reasons it's critical, but also because the current student assignment plan is racially um, discriminatory. And that may not be the intention, but because um, it's the byproduct, because of the community that is being pulled out of its neighborhood, out of their neighborhood since uh, Chief Satellite resides, uh, disproportionately affects our students of color and our families of color. So um, that's another reason why I believe this is such a critical uh, moment in our history, our district's history. And you've talked about getting your 60 minutes moment. Mm -hmm. I see this being a documentary um, about how we as a district uh, refuse to go back to segregated schools and how when so many have yes and right. and and that's already our story um, in fact there was a New York Times article out just a couple of days ago that, that showcased some of that um, I would have liked to have seen it uh, interview more uh, of the boots on the ground activists that are um, I agree it could have been a lot more and, depth and families Examples of bus students with a manual, a white manual yeah. student. Um, no, there are success stories of our students who have been bussed out of the West End. We want to keep those options available for those who are benefiting from being out, bussed out of their communities to a school across town. But we also, we would like to see that go both ways. It needs to be more equitable. We need to be attracting just as many families from the South and the East to the West End to get that diversity, to keep the, the, the uh, diverse populations, although we really don't even have that much diversity right now. We have moved away. We've got some really highly saturated minority schools, and then you've got schools like Manual that, uh, again, in that article, she mentioned that that was her first experience with black students, uh, but Manual only has 15% black students, and the district is 36. So that was not necessarily a true reflection. And now you've got generations of students. You've got moms and dads of students who, who now live in different parts of the community and they had those opportunities because they came up through JCPS and were bused across town. So those are the stories I'd like to see showcased in the future. 
But again, I think that this is this is a documentary in the making, and um, I'm glad you're here and up for the job and doing the work, and I'm glad we're here to support you, right. um, because that's that was another thing that we mentioned in the article. Sometimes the reason I think you don't move as quickly as we would like is because there's not enough community support for what you're trying to accomplish. And so if if we can bring that support, if we can raise the awareness and get increase buy-in, increase buy-in, get people to speak at board meetings, get people to call their board members. You know, kind of generate that that interest so that the community knows. And the, the thing about student assignment is a lot of community members are still asleep. So when, if and when a change comes down, they may not know until they get assigned to another school that, oh my gosh, something just happened. And so we would like to see and be part of getting out in the community and making sure everybody's mm -hmm. aware. So um, why don't you give a just a two-minute synopsis of where you are with the student assignment plan and what's on the agenda. Sure. Um, you know, I've been a part of the student assignment plan for all 23 years of my career in JCPS, and there have been changes, um, but I think some of the same issues that you brought up have been around for 23 years and probably longer. I can just speak to my 23 years. You know, the first thing I want to say is this issue is too big for it to be my decision, Marty Polio decision, which you know, some smaller things should be, but this should not. This needs to be a community decision. Um, and so I've said that many times. And if people are just finding out about it when it's time to assign to schools and we make changes, then we haven't done our job getting that word out there. So that's, first of all, the big thing. I can tell you um, we have put together a task force and, and admittedly moved slow early on, but it's difficult to bring people together and just teaching them our student assignment plan is so challenging because it is a very complex student assignment plan. But one of the issues that I brought up, and I do believe um, choice is so important um, to community members, to students, to parents, um, they want choice. They want an opportunity to um, choose another school if they're not um, pleased with the, their assigned school. Um, and so for, for a long time, I have felt, especially at middle and high school, that if a child is not successful in our satellite zone areas, primarily West Louisville, um, they have not, uh, whether it be attendance, grades, or behavior in elementary or middle school, that they limit their choice to one. And I say a cho well, choice of one is not a choice. Right. And unfortunately for those students, oftentimes that might mean a long bus ride or 45 minutes across town. Um, and so we still, I'm not saying we eliminate that opportunity. One of the things that the task force has proposed though um, are students that live in our satellite resides that they would actually have too. They would have the opportunity to go to a renovated academy at Shawnee, or they would have the opportunity to go to a brand new middle school in West Louisville, or they could still go to that because right now every other middle or high school student in our community, other than our satellite zoned areas, have the opportunity to go to a middle or high school close to their home. Our West Louisville students do not. Um, I am very cognizant and worried, though, about what the impact would be on diversity. But I do agree with you that does not mean that, that we should limit the choice of West End, student, or West End students and families just because of that. So what we have to do, I agree 100%, is to Look at our magnet schools, make them extremely magnetic. Um, a problem we do have are those that are the most magnetic schools usually are the ones that are 100% magnet. There is no reside. So we're gonna have to address those issues. Um, but you know, I'm a believer in giving every student choice and that definitely means more than one. So where we are on the task force is the task force has approved that to at least be explored by a consultant and then us to get community feedback on that. Before I say that's where we're going, we need a lot of community feedback on that. Um, and then secondly, we're really now digging into magnets and how we can make them more magnetic, how we can make the process of applications more transparent, um, how we can diversify our magnets more, um, and make sure that, that all of our students throughout the community are accessing these fantastic, fantastic magnets and even making them more magnetic. Maybe that includes new types of schools. Um, who's to say that, that we might not develop new schools that would have um, a Montessori high school? 
a new magnet focus that would that you know we require a balance of access across our entire community. Um, I think that benefits all. Um, so we have a ways to go on it, but uh, I do believe we are headed in the right direction of increasing choice for often our most vulnerable students. Absolutely, and the dual resides idea, um, we of course support that. Um, but my concern, like you said, is it leads to segregation, um, and I think it's also. And I'd like to address that for a moment. Let me finish. Point. Sure, it's low hanging fruit. So I want to see the district do some heavy lift when they're doing low-hanging fruit, because if you just sell the low-hanging fruit to the community and then later come back with a heavy lift, it'll get rejected. So if you pair low-hanging fruit with heavy lift, if we can get the dual resides uh, approved, but also say um, we're going to require our magnets uh, come within 10% of the demographics of our district, and if they don't, then they lose their ability to be magnet only and they have to start taking a, like have some ultimatum that you have your chance to uh, come come be part of the solution and um, have these kids that um, have some of our kids that maybe require um, more funding any school could like they come with a package and if a school says well I want that funding well then you take this demographic you know um, so that Everybody has that same incentive to want to, to be the solution. And um, Yvonne, you wanted to say something. I just wanted to do a plug for diverse schools because I'm really old. <laughs> and I was in that small window when there were desegregated schools all across America. So I went to a school, I'm Hispanic, but I didn't go to, to Miami High, nicknamed Havana High. I went to a school with rich white kids, and it totally changed my life. You know, I'd be a receptionist in West Miami right now. Instead, I went to an Ivy League university. You know, absolutely, it changed my life in ways that I, I honestly don't even know myself. And to think that people might be denied that, right? Well, I, you know, I think. Um, we definitely want diverse schools. So first of all, I think a major problem we've had is our schools um, in our at-risk neighborhoods need to be incredible facilities with incredible programs um, and great teachers in there. And not to say we don't have great teachers in those schools now, but I do think we are missing um, the incredible facilities and, and the magnet programs that draw students. And so whether we look at, I know when my daughter was going into kindergarten, um, they had just started the um, performing arts at Lincoln, but there were hardly any students at Lincoln at the time. And so we sent her to Hawthorne, but look what's happened to Lincoln in that time period because of a beautiful facility that's been added and a very magnetic program. Absolutely. And now I it's, go Hawthorne, my kids went there too. Great. <laughs> Spanish immersion, my, my daughter is, uh, fluent in Spanish, so it was a great program for us. But I think that's a big part of it, is um, we can have great facilities. I, I think of a high school that has incredible career and technical education facilities, like we're gonna have it at the Academy at Shawnee. Um, and, and I think they become magnetic when people see a great facility. Um, and we have to resource, there is no doubt, we have to resource our high need schools in a different way. Well, and some have been calling for a Y Pass type curriculum or program at Shawnee that would attract, uh, it would be a different cultural um, in, uh, immersion program. I don't know if it's music immersion or performing arts. I'll say performing That's arts. That's a great immersion. idea. Um, but with a different culture and different yep. flair. And it would attract people from all over the district. That's your goal. If you want a magnetic school, yeah, we need to serve the students that live in the West yep. End, but we also want to make sure we attract from all over the district and something like a, a white pass in the West End um, with Afrocentric um, styling mm -hmm. would be very attractive. Um, so that's an idea. Um, one of the other thoughts that I had and I was thinking about actually speaking with this for you, so maybe I'm really good. <laughs> three minutes is never enough. So I, maybe I get to see a little bit different flavor of it. Um, one of the you were talking about teachers and recruiting teachers to schools like Shawnee. Um, when my son was there, we had fabulous teachers, 
but they weren't getting district support. I'm sure all that has changed or is in the process of changing under you. The culture and climate was toxic. All that is definitely changing under you. Um, but they just didn't have the supports they needed to be successful. So the burnout was high. The turnover was high because they eventually just had to get out of such a toxic relationship. So, um, and all of that really stems from high stakes test scores, which we talked about at the top of the show. So if some of our schools to be exempt. I know that's probably not the right word because the state will say no, but um, some way to take the emphasis off of the test scores and point out the fact that we can't be comparing a Shawnee to a school like Manual. They're both great schools in their own right, but they have different demographics and they serve different populations. So when all we look at is a test score and then you see, oh, well, Shawnee didn't do as well as Manual, so everybody's clamoring to go to Manual instead of recognizing Shawnee invests twice as much per student as manual, probably more. Uh, Shawnee no could have smaller class sizes. I don't know if they do or not, but that could be an they incentive do. that would drive more parents to say, well, I want this, I want $16,000 a year invested on my kid, and I want a, a 18 to 1 student ratio, and these things become the selling point instead of just test scores, because if all you look at is the test scores, first of all, a building doesn't create the test scores. Uh, the population that it's serving is what drives those test scores, and so even if you sent your low performing student to a high performing school, that doesn't mean they're going to excel and vice versa. My son, high performing student, went to a low performing school and he did fantastic. Yeah. So um, we have to help parents make better decisions by giving them better information, but then also accentuate the differences and take the emphasis off the test scores if we don't want uh, the schools being compared to each other and then people clamoring for one over the other. And um, I have some questions from our audience. So we were talking about the consultant uh, for, the, for the proposal. Uh, she wanted to know, will the consultant be looking at a few different plans so we can have a choice um, to pick the best plan? Will the consultant actually be bringing several ideas? And uh, how will we go about getting community input from these ideas? So, I mean, this is my first foray down a student assignment consultant. I think the last time it was significantly done, Dr. Berman was the superintendent at the time. And to my knowledge, I don't think that went well. Um, so our plan is we'll put an RFP out um, for a consultant that does this work. That consultant would be a requirement that they would meet with um, this task force to kind of spell out what we're looking for and what we want. Um, you know, what I would like to see are several options that we bring back to our task force, to the community, and to our board, mm -hmm. um, when it, especially when it comes to the dual resides, and we might have some other aspects of that. I think we can do the um, magnet part of that work on our own and make the recommendations. Um, but what we would ask are several options or um, you know, ways to do that, and then we could debate then which one, if any of them, we think is right for Jefferson County. And yes, we plan on plenty of input from the community on that before uh, we do it. I think what happened last time, the input wasn't there. Um, it probably rushed a little quickly, and when it was implemented, it was not effective. Okay. Um, you are listening to Save Our Schools with Dear JCPS. Our guest in the studio today is Dr. Marty Polio, the superintendent for Jefferson County Public Schools. We're so glad to have you. Thank you. Um, an honor. It is an honor, and there's I've got so many things that I want to talk to you about. We're going to have to have you on again next week. Yeah, <laughs> well, I'll come back. I don't know if next week, but I'll come back on. I'm teaching. Um, please be kind. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll be worn out. That's the second day of school. <laughs> oh, yes, this is true. So one of the thoughts that I had, and I spoke about this, I believe, at the last student assignment meeting, is uh, really Shawnee is, it keeps coming up because that's really the genesis of all of the things that need to be unwound. We've taken that community and busted them out of their neighborhoods and then we actually backfill. The kids that go to Shawnee, many of them don't even live in Shawnee. They've been busted in from a panhandle from around the, the community. So in order to really make equitable uh, student assignments, we kind of have to find a way to unwind those pieces. And so um, as a parent at Shawnee on the first day of school, I witnessed uh, Students who show up there, either naively hoping that they, if they pretend it's their school, they might get in, or um, maybe they really don't know because it is confusing. Um, but because that's where the genesis of all of this comes from, I would imagine that 
That, that happens every school, but it, it probably does. happens more so at Shawnee probably. simply because of that. So I wanted to see if the committee members from the Student Assignment Committee could make arrangements to be present the first day of school to actually see the desire and uh, talk to the kids, talk to the families, ask real questions about how do we solve these problems because I don't know what those answers are. I just know when I go down there, there are problems that need to be solved. And um, hopefully Tim Rice would be welcoming of having some, it's not really scrutiny um, because it's not intended to say these are all the things you're doing wrong, JCPS. It's more like, okay, let's understand the situation in the moment when we have the opportunity because the second day and the third day and the fourth day, those opportunities don't present themselves mm -hmm. anymore. So come down when the time is right. Um, Liz uh, Schimmel from WFPL, I told her about some of my experiences. She was like, oh, I wonder if I could come. Would you welcome, uh, again, not scrutiny, but, but solution-based, how can we help? How, we, how can we as a community help shed light on these challenges so they don't just continue to be swept under the rug and be part of the solution? Sure, I'd be happy to. I mean, uh, I want to bring Principal Rice into that yes. conversation. I saw her today so briefly. I wanted to ask her, but we were passing each other. I was, I was just down at the back. Of I mean, I just know as a principal what the first day of school is like. Yes, and it's so crazy. It no, is, but we, is, we help. We so, actually uh, but I mean, I'm sure. people, and it'll be, it'll be, we'll be working. I, I know Principal Rice well, and, and she is transparent and open, yes, yes. and I don't think there would be any problems um, with that as long as it doesn't get in the way of first day operations, Absolutely. because it is a challenging day for schools. Absolutely. Um, I, you know, I've done, I've been a high school principal. Well, I'll say this, when I was at Shawnee, there were 900 students at Shawnee, that was 1997, and the school and the staff and everyone was lamenting the fact that the school was down to 900 students. Yeah, now we're down to 500. And that was, and that, and so it was cut in half from about 10 years before that, and it's been cut in half again. So clearly what we're doing is not getting the, the students to Shawnee. Right. And so I've always had a passion for Shawnee, and I think anybody does their first school yeah. they walk into. So, sure. um, you know, we, we want to change that. And, you know, I used the example in the task force of a kid who lives two blocks from Shawnee, and if they haven't had, they haven't met the criteria for entrance or transfer into Shawnee, they have to go to is Pleasure Ridge Park. Mm -hmm. So you know, we know that what a, what a drive must be from two blocks from Shawnee to Pleasure yeah. Ridge Park, mm -hmm. I mean, is probably a 30 minute drive. And so um, I think that child should still have that option to do that, sure. but they should also have that option to walk into Shawnee and right. enroll there. Right, because we're hearing from parents that, you know, a lot of times these are parents that don't have transportation. They may be work That's and they can't get off work just to go pick up a sick child or, or meet with the P, uh, PTA or the uh, teacher, parent-teacher conference. Um, and so we've placed a, an additional burden on those families who can least afford it. Um, when families like myself could easily drop what I'm doing and go pick up my child. So those of us that have that flexibility uh, and, that, and the agency to advocate for ourselves and the resources could be the ones picking up the, the additional burden. And I'll say this, I mean, uh, just a simple thing like, my daughter catches the bus every morning at 6:45. Um, usually, I'm gone, but if she missed the bus, right, I could say I'm I could be upset with her, but I would come back, pick her up, and right. drive her to school. Um, when we're talking these type of distances, that becomes difficult for any family, yeah. exactly. you know, especially that one you know might have challenges with transportation, um, you know, or other um, challenges. So, I, I just think giving that option is so important. Our listeners may not be aware that in order to even apply for a transfer, transfer you have to have a 3.5 grade point average. Right. You can't have any behavior or discipline issues, which we may have contributed to by putting a child on a bus so much longer. They, their behavior and discipline issues might be because they were on a 30-minute bus ride too many days and finally just acted out. No. So that's correct. A kid could make a mistake in the sixth grade uh, behavior. Let's say they get in an altercation at school, and so I'm not. And they might have been defending themselves. And, and they, you know, there needs to be consequences for that. We can't have altercations in school. However, I don't think it should disqualify them from having choice right. when they're applying for a high school. Especially if it's just to attend a school person from your home. Which no one else is faced with that That's correct. requirement other than West End families who can't even apply to attend the school closest to their homes if their child has not met all of those criteria. So even before the dual resides, you could eliminate the application requirement. It'd still be up to the principal Rice to decide if a student uh, belongs at Shawnee or not. But being able to just simply apply 
those kids that show up, those 100 kids that show up at the first day of school that I witnessed, a lot of times couldn't apply is why they're trying this next mm-hmm. thing. So um, I would really like to see something like that. As well. So Yvonne, do you have anything on student assignment that you would like to No, I, I've already done all the chiming. I, <laughs> I've already done too much chiming. <laughs> Really, I have another question for Melissa. Okay. So, um, this per- this is a teacher who wanted to know if a parent chooses their satellite school instead of Shawnee, and then that kid gets in trouble at his satellite, could they ship them back to Shawnee? Like, there are some some yeah. um, negatives. Yeah. So that that is some of the um, things we have to work out. So when we are talking about a comprehensive non full magnet school, your reside school, that school must unless something is done that would qualify you for an alternative school. You know, that is something we're tackling with magnet schools. If you accept the student, right. should they be yours um, right. for the entire, just Shawnee like in the, some uh, Correct. Yep. So um, that's something we're tackling. But the way I see it, and we would still have a lot to work out, is that the parent would choose at the beginning of the year which one would be their reside school. And that would be their reside school for the year. Now, we might give them that option at the beginning of every year to make that choice. Um, but what we wouldn't necessarily do is have the school with the option, you're not successful, you have to go to right. Shawnee. Because they can do that with scores as well. We've seen, that's, that's one correct. of the objections we have to charter schools because they push out behavior, uh, low scores, um, expensive to educate kids. So keeping so, them from being able to just do that. So our goal is to once again, keep choice. And so, Picking a student out would, would decrease choice. Yeah. There. So I can't say that is the way it's going to be. I picture it that way, that we would have to have those type of stipulations. Um, but those are things we'll have to work out. Very good. So um, yesterday you and I exchanged a message about uh, a social security card being required at registration. Can you give us a little bit of update? There was an error in the communication, and yeah, our think, listeners know what the. It was a miscommunication from the school, I believe, as I looked into it, and we appreciate you sending that because the, that communication was an error, um, where the school had sent out a messenger saying that a social security card was required um, for registration, which clearly it is not. I repeat, um, a social security card is not required for registration. Um, proof of address. Um, and there's about seven or eight other things legally um, that a student can bring to register with proof of address. Interestingly enough, one of them is the family Bible with the family's names on it. We found that in legislation as we were looking this up. Um, but a social security card is not one of them. What a social security card is needed for is to register for the account for keys money. Okay. Keys money being the money our state gives to students who get certain grades um, in high school when they go to college. Um, So we would say, yes, I encourage every parent to to enroll in keys and get that. And, but that's not required for registration. It is required for the keys application. Okay, thank you. Um, Earlier today, I met with council president, David James, Mm -hmm. central council president. And we were talking about uh, ways, Tyra Walker was also with me. Um, and she's with the Kentucky Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression. And she's a teacher. And she's an elementary teacher as well. She's African-American. Um, she arranged a meeting. I just tagged along. And um, we were talking about how to address the violence, the gang violence in particular. And uh, these are our students. Even though this may not be a, a school issue, um, these are still our students. It affects their lives. It affects their classmates. It affects their community. Their, their commute even back and forth to school um, and so a couple of ideas came from that meeting and he gave me blessing to bring them to you because I said oh I'm going to be talking to Doug Foley today. So one is um, can we get uh, when we have students in JCPS their captive audience um, somewhere around fifth grade maybe um, can we get a men of quality and uh, those types of mentor type groups uh, around the table so we can come up with a, a program perhaps to bring into the fifth grade class or fourth grade class that really just kind of helps them be aware of their of their options and serving uh, as a good role model and leader and, and 
build that rapport with the kids and in the at-risk schools in particular. You give the message, you're better than this. Yes, mm -hmm. and, and you know, here are some outlets that you can when you find yourself in this situation. Or, um, and he even mentioned that a lot of um, a lot of our citizens today don't understand civics and how that whole dynamic works. Mm -hmm. So even incorporating a civics lesson into this program, um, would that be something that JCPS and Metro Council and whomever else the interested mm -hmm. parties could get together and we find a way to bring the program into JCPS during the school day, make it part of the curriculum, and really teach the, the life skills? Not, and I don't mean like a life skills class. That's, that's also a good idea. But this is more uh, targeted. Well, and, and groups that would come together for this roundtable would be who would decide what the topics would be. But we know we have a problem, and we know that uh, role models and mentors and people who care about these kids um, can, can change the trajectory. So uh, I'll, I will take back to him that you said, yes, sure. let's get yeah. a meeting of yeah. the minds and let, together. And let me comment on that. Um, you know, one of the things I think that's so important about public education um, that we have to understand, and I told faculty is today, and I've said it, um, in 23 years, I do not believe kids have changed. Um, I really don't. Now, I think our, uh, the challenges our kids face, um, and our world has changed, which obviously impact children, but I do not think kids have changed whatsoever. We were dealing with a lot of the same issues when I was a teacher at Shawnee in 1997 and trying to tackle the same thing. I think it's so important in this that we don't just say this is the school's responsibility, right. because that is a, a, a narrative that I've heard my entire career that school, so whatever we think needs to be um, you know, supportive of kids, it's, well, the schools need to do that. The schools need, and we need to own, take ownership and the responsibility. But I'll say this again, we have kids 17% of the time, and they're somewhere else 83% of the Absolutely. time. And so I believe communities that are successful say it's not just the school's responsibility, it, it, the school is a major part of it, but it's all of us to work together yes. to figure out solutions to help our kids. And we have to identify the root cause of the problem, yes. which, you know, we can start with poverty, um, segregated housing in the community, um, yes. you know, uh, traumatic experiences, adverse childhood experience. I mean, we can go down the line and those are the root causes that we have to work to address. Education, we have to take ownership of and say, we need to do a better job with our kids but we need to have an entire community that is behind this. So definitely in with that, but as long as we take a community-wide approach to the answers. Absolutely, and one of the pieces of this also involves the police. Um, it was brought up that we should have the police as part of this because when they're not in our schools, when our students are not in our schools, they're out in the community, and police are dealing with a lot of the same fallout, the same issues, and the same after hours that we're dealing with. So. Um, there is also a concern from that community that uh, our students are over policed, so we need to be approached properly and carefully. But they do they do share a role, and they need to be part of that solution. And it's like having parents; both parents need to be on the same page, so that when something happens at home uh, during the day, and then dad gets home at night, or we'll play play a little. When mom gets home at night, we'll shift it up and make it 20, 2019 appropriate. Um, that that everybody's on the same page, and that they're not. Uh, mixing messages or saying the wrong message. So um, that would be uh, important to make sure that our police community is also part of this I agree 100%. This, part I of this think the more, the more parties are at the table, the better off we'll be. Okay. So, and then another conversation that came up in our meeting with him uh, that I also have permission to bring back to you is that these pension cuts that are coming down from the state um, are really placing a tremendous financial burden on both our metro government and on our school district. And then on top of that, um, our district, our community, our, our county is the source of funding for a lot of schools outside of our district and um, projects outside of our out 75 of our county. cents of every dollar collected here. So the community needs to understand that this is not sustainable. These continued cuts and pushes down on us um, will eventually cause our demise if they're not if revenue is not found. And so instead of us scrambling to raise taxes and uh, cutting programs like they're doing in Louisville Metro, uh, raising the awareness that no, Governor Bevan, this is on you. You need to raise raise revenue, or we'll find someone who will. 
and he is challenging you to be uh, part of that message with him and call it out, push back, say we need revenue, we need revenue, we need revenue. Even if we make these cuts, even if we raise the nickel tax and do this and do that, it's we need we need fully funded public school. I think I have that um, and we need to be addressing that with gusto every time it's brought up. That no, this is coming from this the top because if we just keep adapting. Then they'll want more. And they'll want more, and that's yeah. I agree. Work. I mean, we've seen um, recently where professional development has been cut, textbook mm -hmm. has been cut, transportation has been cut. So there's no doubt Tap. that. that you know, we need yeah, we um, used to get yeah. several hundred thousand dollars from the state. That was That's another gone. cut. So additional funding. I also think, Gay, that I think our state really needs to re-examine the SEEK funding because, like I said, for every dollar we take in, nearly 75 cents goes out to the state. And in the early 90s, when that law was enacted, um, there was definitely some inequities, especially in far eastern Kentucky, where, um, you know, there was no not a lot of property assessment and, and they needed support. And so we send a lot of our dollars out because of the property assessment in Jefferson County. However, we know the poverty that's in our community. Right. Um, and so I think we really, I'm not saying that, that there shouldn't be some type of seat funding, but when we are giving 75 cents for every dollar away to other districts with the need that we have in our community, I think that really needs to be reexamined as well as additional revenue for our schools. That's going to be a really challenging battle because there are just as many people dedicated to our student assignment plan as there are to the seek yep. uh, allocation of funds. Um, so, and, and I, I'm not even sure I'm going to agree with you on that because I have seen and been in those rural counties. I lived in Corbin, Good. Kentucky for two years. Um, although they did have a really nice school building, um, money can build, build nice buildings, but that still doesn't educate kids. We need we need high-speed internet and technology that can be used to deliver. So let me be clear. I'm not saying to take money away from those schools. Okay. They might have to be funded in another way. Okay. As a matter of fact, when I was a new superintendent, I went through um, similar to a K-TIP program, teacher internship, which ironically has also been cut. Yes. Um, but it was for new superintendents, and I had a colleague who was um, – superintendent in a far eastern Kentucky County and I was lamenting some of the challenges that I had here in Jefferson County at that time some of them you know well about um, and you know I was kind of crying about my job and the things I had to decide and she told me that she was worried about making payroll two weeks from now and so I said okay you win you've got the payroll. you're worried about paying your teachers um, so I'm definitely not saying that at all my um, my only belief is that um, with the need that we have in our community, with you. the current status of our buildings, I'm not so sure if 75 cents of every dollar of Jefferson County tax money should be going to other counties. Right. Right. So um, that is a challenge that we definitely need to address and raise awareness of yep. and even get out. He's going to be going out into the rural communities and helping people understand that if we fall, it's not going to be pretty for them either. No, so true. We, we need to help people understand what's really behind this push to privatize our schools, to, to dismantle the pensions. Um, there's an agenda out there. It's played out in other states. We don't have to guess. We're not making this up. This you can see what happened in Detroit where they privatized the schools, roads, the water system. It wasn't just in Flint. It was... Oh, I'm, I'm aware. I'm aware it... Um to school at Indiana University in Indianapolis right now. I mean, I think they've closed a multitude of mm -hmm. high schools that have been around for many years. It's really sad. Um, so I'm not, you know, I'm not intimate with the situation, but I do know many of the high schools that were a part of my undergraduate <coughs> observations are now no longer. Yeah, and that's their community. That's, yep. that's their that's history, right. their legacy, their, their families and, you know, kids and parents, and, you know, they lose all that legacy. The schools that open up, the charters end up closing or, you know, getting caught with their hands in the where they shouldn't be. Um, so Yvonne has a really great road show that she has just put, put a little plug together on both what's wrong with charters and why scholarship tax credits are a bad deal. 
and I'm going to be in Breckenridge County on Saturday, September 8th. Woo! But I'm willing to go anywhere. I've been talks in Carter County, Lexington, and also Breathitt County. So. And I would encourage you, some research came out this week about vouchers. Um, and I encourage you to take a look at that. Work that into your program. I will. Because Thank there you. Are, there's some research that um, is showing um, it's not quite the success model that it's been made out to be. Well, the amount of people, when you hear scholarship in your head, you fill in full. No, oh, this is four thousand dollars. Four thousand dollars. I'm sorry, is not going to get you into Assumption, Saint no. X, Trinity. No. It's not going to get you into Little Sisters of the Poor because Little Sisters of the Poor is six thousand five hundred dollars. And the kids that are already going there can use it to offset their exactly. tuition. That their, that their daddies and mommies will be happy about that. But I'm if sure. you give to the tuition tax credit, you can make money on that deal. Yeah. We spent a whole show on that, so if you guys want to learn more about that, um, you can look it up on SoundCloud. Um, so, let's talk a little bit about school board elections. Okay. Because we have an open seat, and there were 13 That's applicants. That's correct. I was shocked that there were 13 I'm so surprised. I'm so four. excited. That's when great it, news. That's great when news. it came down to the wire, there was like two. Well, it was zero yeah. up about a week ago, and so mm -hmm. I didn't know what was going to happen with that. We've got 13, so it's real uh, positive about people wanting to be involved. And I think the deadline was a postal deadline, too, so you may still even get a couple more to I think it was 4.30 uh, yesterday afternoon. By that time, or no? I believe, okay. I believe received. I believe received. I think our general counsel, Kevin Brown, said the final count was 13, okay. so I think that's where we are. So if you are one of those 13 and you're listening to our show, we would like to give you a, a questionnaire to complete so that we can um, consider an endorsement or two. We, we've endorsed several. It's not necessarily the best, but these are people who have the characteristics that would do a good job that we look for. And then we would give you our recommendations and endorse those candidates. So if you're listening and you are uh, one of the 13, please email us at moderator at dearjcps.com, and we will get one of those questionnaires off to you. And I know it's being decided by the board, so it's not like our endorsement really carries all that much weight, but we may show you something that, or your board, something mm -hmm. that they hadn't considered. Um, but then there's also the election in November. They have to file and run again in November, and then again in 2020. That is crazy. It's unbelievable. I did not realize that on the front end of this. Yeah. Uh, the state law, the statute is clear about that, the run in the next general election, which is because we fall. have a gubernatorial election. So I know that's, that that's challenging. You know, I probably won't be a whole big part of this because essentially it's selecting what is my boss right. bosses. Um, so I'll help with the process um, with our board assist in the process. But clearly our six board members will be making the choice of who will fill that seat. Okay. We've got about two minutes left and I wanted you to have a chance to give some back to school updates as well as anything people need to know about SROs. And don't forget the water bottle. Mm -hmm. So while you're answering that question, I'm going to get something over here. Sure. Um, so back to school. So two weeks from yesterday, we begin. We kick it off. Um, and Bus Finder is now live and online. So uh, a couple things I would really encourage parents. Verify enrollment. It helps us so much. It helps your child um, when we verify enrollment. And then verify transportation with the school, how that child, are they going to be a bus rider, are they going to be a walker, car rider, whatever that might be. But um, the more parents can assist us by checking with their school, if they're not sure, they can always call 313-HELP uh, to get any information about going back to school. I know my daughter and I, this past weekend when Bus Finder became live, you know a teenage girl. The most important thing for her is what time do I have to catch the bus? So we were on there. This <laughs> like, can I sleep in? Yeah, so yeah. we were on there this weekend. Um, but any any issues at all, any concerns, any questions, not sure about enrollment, um, when open houses might be, when enrollments, registrations, 313 help is that number. Um, or go to our website, jefferson.ky.schools. Um, we'll get then there's a right on the home page, a big link where they can click back to school. We have an entire web page dedicated to back to school. So I'd really encourage that. 
and uniforms. So I, I was getting a lot of, I was down at Shawnee for their backpack giveaway and I was getting a lot of questions about uniforms because it wasn't just Shawnee students, it was people from all over the district asking a lot of questions. Yeah, so, so that they can definitely, 313 help will get in touch or they can call their school um, to get involved in that um, and make sure that uh, they get all those questions answered. Okay. And are we going to be short staffed? Well, we're hiring away right now. We are, I, I believe we're going to be in a much better position than we were last year. Um, you know, I was talking to new teachers this morning, about 350 of them, enthusiastic group of teachers. Um, and we're still hiring. Um, you know, I've got to cut you off. Oh, we sorry. Out of time, but thank you so All much right. for joining us. Enjoy and we wanted it, guys. to give you this mug as a thank you All for right. coming on our show. It says, Kentucky needs fully thank funded public much. schools. Thank you, Marty. It's a very nice water bottle. Push your button right now. Yep. Okay. Let's just see how we did. Great show, guys. That's good. Oh, Enjoyed we're it. still live. <laughs> oh, sorry. What was right. that? Feedback. We're still live, and so I wanted to come over here and warn him before he said anything without realizing that we were still on camera. <laughs> but um, so I'm going to end this. Thank you guys for joining us, and yes. feel free to post any questions on the chat and we will try to get answers for you as well as links to how you can order a water bottle just like that one. So thank you for joining us. Sorry about that. I was trying to you didn't click the it says end. Oh did it not go? Oh yes end. <laughs>